My work as an astrophysicist is something that you might naively think is a little bit boring. I want to map and understand hydrogen around distant galaxies because there are giant clouds of hydrogen in our galaxy, around other galaxies, around probably every galaxy. And actually, like I like galaxies, but I'm not that into them. Like they're beautiful and transcendent <laughs> and gorgeous. Like sure, totally, I get it. But what really interests me is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest atom. It consists of a single proton and a single electron hanging out together. And if you had asked even me like 15 years ago what topics might interest me most as a scientist, I probably would have told you, being like the grandiose person that I am, I would have said like finding life on other planets or discovering new things about black holes or like nuclear physics or something a little flashier that maybe would be more likely to win me a Nobel Prize. But much to my surprise and delight, it is hydrogen all the way for me. And hydrogen is incredibly important, even if you don't realize it, and it is the reason that I'm standing here talking to you today. There was a time right before the universe started when nothing existed, when the universe itself didn't really exist and time didn't actually exist. So to talk about a time before is a little misleading, but bear with me. Between that moment when nothing existed and right now, the universe was born in the Big Bang and it was a burst of energy and that energy has changed and evolved over 13 and a half billion years to where we are today. And I look at the gulf between those two states, between right before everything started and where we are right now, and I am in awe of that change. Think about everything that you've ever experienced, everyone that you've ever loved, everything that has ever happened anywhere. And it is because of that evolution of energy over time. And my next feeling after awe is that I want to know how and I want to know why. And we've made huge strides in understanding how and why. Gravity, which is my most favorite force, given enough time, gravity will take an evenly distributed collection of matter and condense that matter into sheets, condense those sheets into filaments, condense those filaments into clumps and clusters. Those clumps, gravity will turn into stars and arrange those stars into galaxies. Some of those stars will have planets form around them. Four and a half billion years go by, and we are standing on one of those planets thinking about it. And so I'm telling you this because none of this would be possible without hydrogen. Now, the most abundant element on Earth and in your body is oxygen. You might have thought I would say hydrogen, but you would have been wrong. It's, <laughs> it's oxygen. The most abundant element on the moon is oxygen. The most abundant element on Mars is oxygen. Oxygen is super important if you live on a rocky planet and you breathe it. But none of us would be here without hydrogen, and that's not just because hydrogen is a critical component of water, and water is necessary for life, although that is also true. The sun is basically just a giant ball of hydrogen that is beautifully, spectacularly on fire. Jupiter, the second best planet in the solar system, is basically <laughs> just a giant ball of hydrogen that failed to ignite, which makes me feel a little bad for Jupiter. <laughs> the Milky Way galaxy where we live is mostly hydrogen. Every galaxy is mostly hydrogen. The universe itself, at least all of the normal stuff that we kind of understand in the universe, is mostly hydrogen, and it has been since the beginning of time. The universe is mostly hydrogen, and this is the reason that I'm standing here today. I really love existing in the universe, and so I'm very grateful to hydrogen. <laughs> and I feel like I owe it to learn a little bit more about it. So, my interest is in hydrogen is partly very self-serving because I'm really happy to be here. Um, but the other thing that I like is um, I like to look at theories and then see the places where they fail. So I told you a story a little bit ago uh, about gravity and how gravity will take matter that's distributed from the Big Bang and condense it eventually into galaxies and stars. And that makes for a really good story, and you guys probably all believe me. But the truth about those stories that we tell about the universe around us is that they are full of things that are not exactly true. 
When you examine the details of any of those steps, it turns out that we don't understand a lot of the really deep, intricate processes that happen. And that's true for almost any theory of anything. If you take a theory and you say that it can explain everything, that might sound good in like a, a storytelling format where the arc of it is correct. So that looks really good if you're far away. As you get closer, you discover that actually there are some places where uh, you are kind of lying to yourself about it. And if you dig into those places, you discover that there are, even within that, parts of your story that are just wrong. And that could be discouraging, but I actually think that that is incredibly exciting, because that is where the super interesting work happens, the places where your theory fails. So like, take gravity, for instance. We have a theory of gravity that tells us that an apple will fall from a tree and be drawn towards the center of the Earth with a certain acceleration, and we call that Newtonian gravity, Newtonian physics. It's the same force that keeps the moon in orbit around us, and it keeps us in orbit around the sun. And that theory of gravity developed by Isaac Newton, something that you might have learned in high school physics, that works really well here on Earth. We can explain a lot of the things that we see in our everyday life using that theory of gravity. But if you start to look in other places, it doesn't actually do an incredibly good job in a lot of places. So take the orbit of Mercury, for example. Uh, you cannot explain the orbit of Mercury using Newtonian gravity. Mercury is so close to the sun, and the sun is so massive that in order to correctly explain its orbit, you need to come up with a different theory. That's how we got general relativity, which is a theory of gravity developed by Albert Einstein. And general relativity and Newtonian gravity can explain the same things happening on Earth, but in those weird situations where Newtonian gravity fails, general relativity does a better job of explaining what's happening. But even general relativity can't explain everything that we see. So if you want to expand out from just our solar system and look at our entire galaxy, if you zoom in to the stars at the very center of our galaxy and you track their orbits, general relativity does a beautiful job of telling us their orbits. We've been looking at them for over two decades and they are like a case study in general relativity. The orbits are perfect. It is a beautiful proof of this theory. But if you zoom out all the way and you look at the stars that are at the very outskirts of the galaxy and you measure their motions, you will discover that their orbits cannot be explained with just general relativity alone. They tell us that the galaxy should weigh a lot more than we think that it does. You can measure the mass of a galaxy in two ways, by the orbits of the stars around it or by counting every single star that you see and a bunch of other stuff that we think is in the galaxy and estimating its mass that way. So two different ways to estimate the mass give you two very different answers, and only one of them can be true. And in order to explain that mass discrepancy, Vera Rubin, an astronomer, came up with the concept of dark matter. It's a way to make the galaxy weigh more, a way to make the galaxy weigh more, um, and account for this extra mass that we know must exist because of the orbits of these stars. And so, even for gravity, something that is so fundamental to our understanding of the universe, we went from Newtonian gravity, which worked pretty well, to general relativity, which did better, to Vera Rubin, looking at the places where general relativity didn't predict the right things, to today, where we are still figuring out gravity. And that is true in almost every type of science, where it's an evolution that you find a theory that explains a lot of things, but it doesn't explain everything. And then when you poke at those places where it doesn't explain, that's how you move the science forward. To be honest, if you told me that you had a theory of the universe that could explain literally everything except for three things, I would say, A, that's awesome and I really want to hear about it, but B, what I most want to hear about are those three things that you can't explain, because that's what's most interesting to me. So, to summarize, I really like hydrogen. <laughs> We're only here because of gravity acting on hydrogen over time, and my most favorite thing is to find a theory and then figure out the places where it's not working. And so that brings me to my own work as an astronomer. I have helped build a telescope called Fireball, which is designed to observe huge clouds of hydrogen outside of distant galaxies. And I've worked on Fireball for over a decade through more tragedies and failures and a few triumphs, but more things than I really have time to tell you about. And I keep working on it because I really want to know what is happening with that hydrogen. When we look out into the universe, we see this incredible diversity of galaxies. Galaxies come in all shapes, all sizes, they're weird colors. 
there's all sorts of types. There's the canonical spiral galaxy, like what you think in your head if you imagine what a beautiful galaxy looks like. But there's also like weird ones that are like ring-shaped or they're really chaotic. And there are these other galaxies that are just balls of stars that are like undifferentiated and unyielding. And we can explain some of those shapes with our current theories. If you have a big galaxy and a little galaxy, typically the big galaxy is gonna eat the little galaxy. Um, but before it does that, the gravitational interaction between those two galaxies will cause the big galaxy to become this gorgeous grand design spiral. So we know that certain gravitational interactions will cause certain shapes in galaxies, but we can't explain every galaxy. The other thing that we can explain is how galaxies form stars and how that process has changed throughout time. So way back at the beginning of the universe, galaxies were forming stars at a super fast rate. Like, stars were just happening all the time all over the universe. And since then, the rate of star formation in any galaxy has actually slowed down. We live in an era of declining star formation, which actually also makes me feel a little sad. But my own feelings about it aside, we can't actually explain why this is happening. We can observe it and say that it happens, but we can't really explain why. But I think that both the shape of the galaxy and the rate of stars forming in it are fundamentally related to the environment around the galaxy, to the region that we would call the galaxy's halo. And so you might think, well, why don't you just observe the halo and see what's there? And the problem with that is that most of the stuff in the galaxy is like in the galaxy. So if you want to observe things outside of the galaxy, there's not stars there, there's not a lot of, of bright things that are easy to observe in the halos of these galaxies. But if you've been paying close attention to this talk, you might guess that what is there is hydrogen. <laughs> and hydrogen is pretty hard to observe, otherwise I would be up here telling you all about all the hydrogen outside of galaxies instead of telling you about how I'm trying to find it. But there are two ways to do it if you're clever. The first way is to do what are called absorption line studies. And this is where you take the light from like a super distant, really bright, object that's really far away, and you see how that light has changed as it passes through the halo of a galaxy that's between you and that super bright object. This is very similar to how you can only see dust in the air when it's illuminated by a sunbeam. You need that like really bright sunlight to light up all the stuff in the air, otherwise it's invisible. And so absorption line studies are almost exactly like that. You're just using objects in space instead of sunlight. And we've done a lot of absorption line studies over the last decade, and they've told us that there is a bunch of hydrogen in the outskirts of a lot of galaxies, almost everywhere that we observe. But what it can't tell us is how much there is and what it's doing, because it provides a very narrow point of view. So the second way of doing these observations is to actually directly observe the hydrogen gas itself. But that is super hard because hydrogen doesn't really emit a lot of light. Hydrogen is in stars, and it's important for stars, but it's not the process that makes this, the light from a star. Um, so it's much, much fainter than just looking at a galaxy. But hydrogen under the right conditions will every so often emit a single photon. Just the one. <laughs> and if you have like a giant cloud of hydrogen that's the size of a galaxy, then you will probably get like a handful of photons every second. And I'm not exaggerating those numbers. The detectors that I work with are designed to detect individual photons as they arrive. But if you build a telescope that is designed just to observe the light from that hydrogen, and if also you're very lucky, then you can start to actually map the emission from hydrogen around distant galaxies. And we're starting to be able to do that, although it's hard and it's slow. But once you can map it, then you can weigh it and you can figure out how much there is. And if you can weigh it, you can see how it's moving and you can determine whether it's flowing into the galaxy to form stars. And then once you've done that on one galaxy, you can do that on a bunch of galaxies and you can look at galaxies that are old and galaxies that are new and you can figure out if the hydrogen around galaxies is responsible for the declining rate of star formation over time. And so this question about hydrogen around distant galaxies is actually a fundamental part of understanding how you form a galaxy and how that galaxy evolves through time. And once we know that, then we can explain how our own galaxy formed and how our own star formed. And so a question about hydrogen that seems so removed from everyone's life is actually a key part of understanding how we got here. And 
those little questions that seem like they're so specific or esoteric as to be useless. They're actually digging away at places where we don't know a theory, where we don't understand, and those are the building blocks to being able to explain the really big questions that we all have about the universe. So think of a theory, something that you think that you know that is so obvious that it's boring. It's like super clear you don't worry about whether or not gravity is gonna be there for you in the morning. And probably in the broad strokes, whatever theory you're thinking of, it's true. Theories only last because they do a good job at predicting the world around us. But if you really want to have a fundamental, deep understanding of what is going on around you, you have to look at the places where the theory fails, where the story that you're telling is wrong. And sometimes that means getting into nitty-gritty details that could be boring or tedious or lame. But I think really the only difference between something that is boring and something that is interesting is how much attention have you paid to it and how carefully have you looked for places where the story that you're telling yourself breaks down and how willing are you to follow the evidence in whatever way it leads you. So to illustrate my point, I would like all of you to close your eyes just for a few minutes. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine nothing and nothingness. I'm not even thinking like a cold, dark universe. I want you to imagine the absence of heat avoid the absence of light, just nothing. Now keep your eyes closed, and instead I want you to imagine your most favorite place. And I want you to think about all the things in that place that you love, maybe there are people there, or the smells, or the feeling of the breeze on your skin. Now I want you to open your eyes. And the difference between that void and your favorite place is hydrogen. And that's what drives me. Thank you very much.